The following podcast is proudly brought to you by Repco, driven by passion for 100 years. I knew there was a problem when the five second board came out. I just remember having a sinking feeling when I thought uh, I'm screwed here. And then there's the, the oral side of things, what, what I could hear, that, that crunching metal, that the noise, I'll, I'll never forget the noise. I felt the heat of the flames before I could see the flames. Uh, we had the front row seat to it, it was directly in front of us by about 20 metres. Steve Owen's car was sitting in this lake of fire with his fuel tank still full of 120 litres of petrol. The burns are just horrible. I remember yelling because of the pain. Welcome to Repco Supercars Rewind. I'm Chad Nalon. Today, we're taking you back to Perth 2011 to relive Carl Reinler's terrifying start line inferno. It's a day that is remembered not just for the spectacular images of Carl frantically tearing himself free from his burning Brad Jones racing Commodore, but also a day that led to improved safety in the design of modern day supercars. And while the incident took place 11 years ago, it now has added significance to Carl as he's recently started a new role driving the medical car at select Formula One events. Stationed at the back of the F1 grid, the medical car remains poised to respond to similar situations to the one Carl experienced in 2011. After recently returning from the Azerbaijan Grand Prix in Baku, we sat down to chat about that remarkable day in Perth and how he thinks he might respond if he again comes face to face with an inferno. Cars in pit lane ready to run and head onto the racetrack for race eight of the championship. 50s again for this one, 100 championship points on the line to the winner. And again, the Vodafone boys are right there up the front, lounge right on the tail of Jamie Winkup for that all important run into turn one. The weather, it's pretty good, 23 degrees at the moment. I grew up in Perth, born and bred, but I'd never really considered Barber Gallo, Barber Gallo at the time, Wanderer Raceway now, to be my, my home circuit. In fact, I very, did very few laps around there. It was my second year with Brad Jones Racing. On, on the personal side of things, I'd, I'd met my, my now wife six months prior and was sort of introducing her to motorsport and, and some good mates as well. But, but, but that particular weekend, I felt very confident going into. I was in a really good headspace. Uh, my family was coming out, my mum and dad, um, brother and sister. So yeah, it was a, it was a special weekend and um, the, the BJR cars were just mega from the outset. So I was, I was feeling over the moon, everyone was pumped, the team was, uh, was stoked. My number one mechanic, Sam, was, uh, was elated. To paint a bit of a picture about what we were working through as a team, some of the other things we were experimenting with, I think we were playing around with different brands of clutch at the time and you can see where I'm going to with this now. Um, I don't remember the brand of clutch, in fact it's probably irrelevant at this stage, but it's, it's common practice in a supercar to use the line locker to load the clutch up, firstly so you don't get a jump start, but by loading up the clutch just a little bit, it squats the car and then when you release the, the brake, it, it propels you like a, like a slingshot so to speak um, for, for a really, you know, a, a, just a great race start. Carl Reindler, the West Aussie, having another great run. Yesterday, seventh, he'll line up 13th today alongside Rick Kelly. While Carl Reindler was having a strong weekend, further down the grid, then Paul Morris Motorsport driver Steve Owen was struggling for pace. He and teammate Russell Ingle were due to start from the 12th row. The struggle too from the Paul Morris cars, Ingle and Owen are right down the back of the field. Myself and Russell, Ingle and my teammate at the time weren't particularly fast, so we, we qualified down the back. Did it feel like a different day? Had things gone right? Had things gone wrong? Had you seen a black cat or anything crazy like that? No, it was just a regular race meeting. So anyway, the warm-up lap was all pretty normal at this stage. I've, um, I've come around doing the, you know, the classic warm-up of the tyres, um, as you do, trying to generate front tyre temp in the supercar. Came up to the grid. I, I remember Sam on the radio guiding me into the, uh, the grid box. 
you never take it out of first gear, or maybe some people do, but it's, it's not good practice to take it out of first gear when you're sitting there. Once it's in gear, you leave it in there for, for security and peace of mind. Wrapped the uh, the brake pressure up, whatever it was, a lot of a lot of PSI in the brakes. You've got the number that comes up on the screen. You click the line locker, take your foot off the brake, and then you start feeling for that, that biting point of, of the clutch. So this is, this is where it starts to go pear-shaped. Green at the back. Race eight of the championship in the West. I knew there was a problem when I think the five second board came out. Something just didn't feel right with the, with the feel of the clutch. I, I had to put my foot to the floor on the clutch because I could feel it trying to release or grab. Um, went to the floor and the car stalled so the, the clutch had completely released on me. And, and by this stage the red, light's, the red light's just about to go on. So I've taken it out of gear. I've managed to fire it up. You know, it still had clarity in the in the moment to um, to get the car fired back up. By that stage, I'd released the line locker. I'm thinking this is going to be a, a rubbish start. Conceded to that um, and and just focus on getting off the line. I put my foot to the floor, gave it a big bucket load of uh, of revs, and tried to jam it into first gear. And with my foot all the way to the floor, jammed it into the first gear, and it stalled straight away. By this stage. The lights had just gone off, and I, I couldn't get. I, could, I was a sitting duck. Right, gets a good initial bite. Alex Davidson makes a stormer. Slots to the inside. That's massive. Oh, and the slot on the grid. He was stalled on the grid, and has been hit from behind. There's another car involved behind. We've got a red flag. You just move. You just need to move around. Pit lane. Oh, it's, just, it's Steve Owen, the VIP uh, pet food's car. He's out of the car. He's okay. Probably the only thing that didn't go to plan was that um, we normally had Paul Morris on the on the headsets as, as a spotter um, which worked quite well a couple of times through the year to avoid accidents um, and for whatever reason both Russell and myself started on the same row so we both got the message about the same time to go left but neither of us got the, got the call possibly because he'd dialed up both cars at the same time so no one got that actual radio message but yeah Paul's actually really good at um, as a spotter being a driver, you know, so um, and got us out of a couple of sticky situations where you, you just hear left, 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 and then you just turn left and then go, oh wow, that was a big crash, I'm glad I avoided that, you know, so um, yeah, that was probably the only thing that was, was unusual about the, the start was it normally Paul spots for us, but for some reason we neither of us got the message. I just remember thinking, um, I just hope, hope no one runs into the back of me, thinking it might be the, the guy behind me or two rows back. Little did I think Steve Owen off the, uh, I forget which row, it was, it was towards the, the tail end on that particular occasion for Steve. I had no idea that he was coming and, and, and the hit, it's, it's really hard to describe the, the feeling. I mean that, that, that hit was, I think they, they measured it at about 37G, which is a, a pretty big hit. But the thing that I recall the most was, was the noise. Like think about crunching metal um, and, and just amplify that, you know, a hundredfold. And that's kind of, it was just, the noise is the one thing that kind of sits with me. That's the first thing I noticed. I remember the car pitching hard on, on the nose because it, it hit me so hard in the back that um, the whole car had lifted up in the rear. And I remember looking down at the bitumen as the car was sort of yawing uh, to the right off onto the grass. I mean, 37 Gs, it was 140 odd K an hour that Steve hit me at. It was the sprint round, so I think 75 litres of E85. Obviously the, the fuel cell was in the boot of the car back then. And first there was the feeling of just being thrown back in the seat. And, the, and the, it's a full carbon fibre, I forget what, we, I think it was a race tech seat that we were using. And it literally split the carbon fibre seat in half from, from the force, which I didn't realise till afterwards and saw it back at the BJR factory. So there's the feeling, and then there's the, the oral side of things, what, what I could hear, that, that crunching metal, that the noise, I'll, I'll never forget the noise. This is yeah. Rymler now. Oh. Oh. I just remember having a sinking feeling when I thought, oh, I'm, I'm screwed here. And I didn't even, t I think I just got to the brake pedal by the time I, I went to the back of Ryan. So, yeah, luckily it wasn't, there wasn't really much time to panic about it. Um, but I do remember with, um, you know, being pleasantly surprised when it, I sort of, I never got knocked out in the incident, in the, in the impact, but a split second or two after the, I just remember looking around thinking, oh, actually I'm all right here. Like I thought, I, I'd probably already 
mentally prepared myself for you know that I was going to be hurt or or, or you know bad things were going to happen. But I just remember being pleasantly surprised straight afterwards, going, "Actually, I'm alright." I felt the heat of the flames before I could see the flames. The, the heat was unlike anything I'd felt before, even with a three-layer race suit and fireproof underwear and a helmet and gloves and all of that. I think my mum and Elise, my wife, was down at turn one and they felt the heat from the grid. So we're talking 250, 300 metres away, maybe more. It, the, the firewall split open from the impact, the raw fuel was pouring into the cabin and the, uh, you know, the, the fire experts estimated that it was between eight and 900 degrees Celsius in, in the cabin. Everyone talks about Carl being obviously in that fire, but you were too. And <laughs> did you have any of the burns or anything similar to what Carl went through? No, I was lucky that one thing that actually saved me was the windscreen tear off. So it shattered the front windscreen quite badly and the, all the fuel went over the front of the car, but the actual windscreen tear off stopped any of the fuel coming inside the car because the windscreen was actually smashed. So it was actually, you know, um, quite handy, but I, I, I didn't have fire in the cabin. So as soon as I realised that I was on fire. I'm like, well, I've got to get out of here pretty quickly. So I went to jump out the, the driver's door. There was fire there, so I shut the door. Went to jump out the passenger door, the fire door there, so I shut that door, and then I just sat on the tunnel, basically, and went, well, I'm, I'm pretty close to the pit lane, so if you're going to have a fire anywhere, that's probably the best place to have it. If I was over the back, away from everyone, I probably would have risked jumping out through the fire, but I just basically sat in the tunnel and watched everyone jumping over the fence with the, uh, the, the fire bombs. It was actually um, one of the boys from Cali Racing, I can't remember his name now, that um, got there first with the fire extinguisher. So it was it was really nice that the pit crew from other teams jumped the pit wall to come and pull the fire out for us. And so they actually got there before the marshals. So it was um, it was lucky that I probably wasn't in, under the fire for, for too long, you know. I think you can hear in the commentary, they first identify your car as being one of the Kelly Racing cars similar black. I wonder if that's why the mechanic was so quick over the fence. Maybe <laughs> they thought it was one of theirs. I never actually thought about that, yeah. Um, but uh, uh, lucky he was. There's another car involved behind. It's really hard to pick up. It's a Kelly, it's a Kelly car, I think. Yeah, it was a black Commodore by the looks of things. I think it's hard to see. I think it's Todd Kelly's car. He was starting right down the back. I'd landed. I'd, thankfully, I had no spinal injury, no neck injury from a rear end incident. If it had you know, I think Steve actually had probably more neck um, issues than what I had from the front on Im impact. You've got a fire bomb in the car, right? There's a button that you press, you're told to press when there's a fire. I don't know how, but I had the, the clarity or judgment, you know, peace, you know, clarity of mind in the heat of the moment, no pun intended, <laughs> not to bother with it. I, I felt at that moment, that fight or flight kind of mindset, there's no point clicking that. I, I knew that a, hitting that firebomb button for the extinguisher was not going to do anything with what I was experiencing in that car. So the priority was get the hell out of there as, as quickly as, as possible. It's a real process to get out of a any race car, but particularly a supercar. You, you know, you've got... Not only you've got the five-point harness, you're in this cocoon. It's claustrophobic in these cars. If, you, if anyone's ever sat in one of those cars, it is, we call it the cockpit. It's like the cockpit of a, a fighter plane, an F-18 Super Hornet. You have no dexterity because you're wearing a pair of gloves. You've got a helmet on which compromises your vision. Five-point harness, you've got the radio attached to the helmet. The cool suit attachment, you've got the helmet fan, there's the, the window net. And then the door latch, it's not a conventional door, it's you know, a little tiny button you've got to press to get out. Then you've got to get out through the small opening. It's, it's a process, but a, a difficult process to be able to do. And then you add the variable of not being able to open your eyes. Everything was burning at that stage. And then the time pressure. I, I don't like cliches, but literally every second counts um, in, in, when something like that happens. If I'd been five more seconds in the car, I don't know what the result might have been. I don't like thinking about what it could have been. I was told that from impact to exit or evacuation, for want of a better word, out of the car was 17 seconds. So um, That's a long time. It, when you think about it... It feels it, quicker watching it, though. You, you stand next to a campfire for sev a little too close for 17 seconds and then imagine that it's between eight and 900 degrees. It was pretty frightening. So I've, I've managed to undo the belts because it's, it's, it's routine. Um, every time I took a breath, I could feel burning the inside of my mouth and my, my throat and my, and my lungs. So I ended up, I ended up taking, I don't know why I, I chose to, but I, I just copped it. I took one deep breath in um, and held my breath, closed my eyes, 
Managed to undo the five-point harness. The cool suit hose had melted, so I didn't have to worry about that. The radio, I literally just yanked my head and, and it snapped the, uh, the radio cable. The helmet fan came off at the same time. The window net I was able to find without opening my eyes, just, just through feel and, and practice. Managed to get to the door, jumped out, and, and by that stage, um, Sam, who I mentioned before, Sam Cosgrove, who was my number one mechanic, legend of a guy still involved in the sport. He had jumped the pit wall, which is kind of illegal on a live racetrack. By that stage, they probably red flagged it anyway. He'd run across a live circuit, which is pretty heroic if you ask me. I think he was looking forward to the opportunity to, to spear tackle me, actually. All the grief <laughs> I've caused him over the, the last two seasons. So he basically decked me to the ground because you couldn't see some of the flames. And, and I, I, yeah, I could feel it burning still. So I did the old, yeah, what you taught as a kid, stop, drop, cover and roll. Do you feel like you were still burning at that point it, when you hit the grass? It felt like I was. I don't know if I actually was, if it was just kind of the... The, the residual effects. Yeah, the residual of yeah. effects of, of having sat in an 800 degree race car. What was hurting at that point? What, what, where could you feel the burns? Um, my, my face and, and my hands, um, which was where predominantly where most of the burns were. I'd actually burnt the back of my leg as well because it had got caught. The suit had got caught on something as I exited the car and just hitched up the back of the race suit enough to expose some skin so there was a, an, another burn there and Carl Carl's Bidler. moving trying to get out of this car quickly he's out of the car that's good to see because that has taken a massive hit from behind the race is red flagged sitting at the back of the grid watching the chaos unfold mere meters in front of him was supercars medical delegate dr carl lee he recently told his side of the story on the supercars youtube channel actually seems like yesterday, thinking about it. But um, yeah, so as usual, we park behind the field, ready for the first lap. The reason we do that, well, the reason why there is a medical car for the first lap is that there's just a higher risk of car-to-car -car contact, which came to fruition in that start there where a car stalled. Uh, so obviously, Carl Reindler had stalled and uh, uh, Steve Owen ran into the back of him, um, and that created this huge fireball. Uh, we had the front row seat to it. It was directly in front of us by about 20 metres. So my recollection of it was that it was quite amazing because the whole incident only took about 11 seconds to extinguish, but it seemed like time stood still in such an incident there. Um, as you will see from the video, you know, the, the, some of the pit crew jumped over the fence immediately with their fire extinguishers and started putting out the fire. The big concern was that Steve Owen's car was sitting in this lake of fire with his fuel tank still full of 120 litres of petrol. Uh, as I got out of my medical car, ran to the back and got my fire extinguisher and ran to the scene, um, and we were careful to approach from the wind, upwind side of the fire. Um, and then uh, what so I could see in my peripheral vision was that Carl Ryan was already getting out of his car. So my focus was purely on getting Steve Owen out of his car, which is what we did. And as you'll see from the video, uh, in play, if you play it in real time, you'll see it happens so quickly and it was all over within 11 seconds. You know, I think we were, they were really, everyone was really lucky that day. Um, it was quite a spectacular incident, which you don't really want to see. Uh, but thankfully, this, the, all the equipment did their protective work. More importantly, the drivers are out of the car. I can see that uh, Carl Ryan is being worked on by Dr. Carl Lee and the medical team from V8 Supercar. He clearly was uh, distressed and trying to get out of there because of the amount of uh, flame around. And uh, there he is going into the back of the ambulance. And the crowd, a fantastic reaction as they applaud Carl Ryan getting off the track and to the back of the ambulance area. The Repco Supercars Rewind Pod will be right back after these short messages. There's a lot of history hidden at Repco, so listen up, because this ad will be gone in 30 seconds. See, some people reckon we've got 10W30 in our veins, or if we look to the skyline, all we see are falcons, bluebirds and 200 bees. The truth is, we've got an unexplainable bond with motoring. Any Mark, Dick or Jamie could tell you that. So dart in store or online today for great deals. Repco, driven by passion for 100 years. If you're loving this podcast, you should check out Supercar's other podcast offering, The Cooldown Lap. It's available the morning after each Supercar's event. Super Archive is the place to enjoy all your favourite old races. It's available on the Supercar's YouTube channel. Make sure you follow us on social media and stay up to date with all the latest news, exclusive video content and live timing at supercars.com.
Tickets and hospitality packages are available to ensure you have the best seat in the house at your favourite track. And if you're an overseas fan of supercars, a Superview subscription is a must for live, uninterrupted supercars action. Now, let's get back to the pod. I very clearly remember being in the medical centre with Carl asking me some questions, but it just felt a bit blurry in there. I remember him asking me questions. I remember yelling because of the pain. There was direct flame to my face. I just cracked my visor open, which everyone does commonly in this uh, in, in touring cars to get a bit of better, a bit of breathability. So my eyebrows brows had burnt off, and, and I had some pretty bad burns to my face. But the burns to my hands were from the radiant heat. So it effectively boiled the fluid in my skin from the inside out. So people were quick to criticize the, the gloves. The gloves, everything, the, the equipment did everything it was supposed to do. You know, in terms of the safety gear that the drivers are wearing, they've got their fireproof underwear, fireproof socks, gloves, balaclavas, helmets, all the gear. There's a lot of apparatus in place in the car and on the driver to ensure that this, when this sort of thing, which happens extremely rarely, does happen, you're as well protected as can be. The bit that let me down was personal choice in opening up my visor. So I strongly encourage everyone that's racing in touring cars to keep their visor down. Or some guys don't even use a visor. But yeah, I was in a lot of discomfort, a lot of pain. And Carl made the, um, the sort of executive decision at that point. No, you've got to get to the hospital. What, you, what you're experiencing is is not something we can deal with. We've, we've done the, the first responder part. We've... Um, I think by that stage I probably had some sort of um, pain relief. Uh, I remember distinctly remember the green whistle. I had a few of those. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, did did the trick until I got to hospital. I got there and and I guess that's when the the real journey began. Uh, burns are just horrible, and it probably leads to you know, I guess the next part of the story. Meeting meeting Fiona, Dr. Fiona Wood. You know how how special she is at her craft. Dr. Fiona Wood is a world expert in treating burns. A Perth-based specialist was awarded Australian of the Year in 2005 for her work treating the many victims of the Bali bomb attack. Dr. Wood personally treated Reindler in the days after the Perth fire using her own spray-on skin technology and a method of treatment known as resell. She actually took skin cells and she effectively grew skin cells and, and she's had this amazing uh, way of spraying the skin cells back on with the skin graft which which I think improved the recovery time of, of the burns so um, it was a horrible experience but I couldn't have been in, in better care the fact that it happened in Perth uh, I was lucky that Dr Fiona Wood was there um, yeah it's it's not a nice thing when they're not to get into the, the nitty-gritty of it but they have to take your skin off before they can start to treat it so that was probably the, one of the worst parts when they uh, no, and you, you try to minimise the amount of pain relief. Um, I can't remember why, but there's a reason for it. Um, so that, yeah, they have to peel your skin off and, and wash them in this. Uh, I don't know, just wash them thoroughly, so they don't get infected, I guess. And um, yeah, it was it was horrendous. I mean, as a kid growing up, I've had my share, fair share of broken bones and um, and bruises and grazes and doing silly things you know coming off bikes and skateboards and what have you just you know being a kid but but burns are just just horrible yeah you, you don't you, if you can avoid getting a burn through your life you you know you uh, yeah it's just not nice so afterwards how long were you in hospital for and, and what was the period like for getting back in a race car was it something you even wanted to do and and what was that experience like getting back behind the wheel? One memory I have, and going winding back to sitting in the med centre with, with Dr Carl, I, all I can remember thinking was, I've qualified really well for the second race this <laughs> afternoon. Is the car going to be ready in time for me to go back out for the second race? Little did I know the thing was basically a paperweight. <laughs> and I, I was gutted because I remember... Right, he won the race. Right, he won it, yeah. And Bargs ended up second or third. He was on the podium as well. So Very bittersweet day, that one. It was sure. bittersweet. I was so happy for the BJR team. And two cars on the podium, including this one, for the first V8 supercar victory for Brad Jones Racing and a long time between, between drinks for Jason Bright. He has not won a race since Bahrain in 2006. Brad Jones Racing have been in this championship for 11 years. They've done 337 races, and today is the day. Jason Bright and Team BOC 
the final turn at Barbagallo. Race eight, we've got another new winner in 2011. It's a breakthrough for the boys from Albury. I couldn't help but feel like how frustrated I was that I had a good race car. I'd qualified inside the top 10 for that second race in the afternoon and I, I was just, I was pissed off that I, I wasn't there. The next race was Winton, uh, three weekends away. But there was an opportunity the week prior to Winton to jump into a, a Porsche. Someone had, had offered their Porsche race car at Barbagello. I was still living in Perth in 2011. Such a critical moment for me to get in that Porsche, go out there and just get on with it. And um, I had a good weekend. It's a club weekend, but I won the rounds and, and, and it, was, it was all good. Look, there's always positives out of a, out of a negative, And I think that one incident uh, forced a lot of change. So the first thing you'll know is that in the current generation of supercars and the Gen 3 cars, the fuel cell was moved from behind the rear axle to in front of the rear axle, um, decreasing the chance of rupture of the fuel cell uh, significantly. Uh, so that was a huge change in terms of the car. And that's just punched straight into the fuel cell. It's split the cell, the fuel's been ignited, but there's a whole lot of electrical apparatus in the back of the cars. There's fuel pumps in there, there's power and batteries and things in there. And, I've, and I don't think I've ever seen anything quite as ferocious on a start line in terms of front to rear impact. It does say the next generation of car that will pull the, put the fuel cell further forward is a great concept. Um, and uh, roll on because really these start line incidents to me they're one of the last frontiers of real danger in our sport. From the emergency response point of view I think it just tidied up a lot of the uh, processes in terms of fire response. Uh, we now have more than four fire officials following the first lap as well. There used to be two prior to that and uh, from my point of view I've certainly increased my fire protection and uh, make it a, a, a point to always have a fire extinguisher in my car although that's obviously not my primary role. What also happened, which was, um, and Roland came up, and Roland being Roland, came up and said, hey, what, what happened? What do we need to do to make things better, sort of thing, basically. One thing when I did, when I opened the driver's door and there was flames, the door release was made out of plastic. So when I, when I shut the door again, it melted the door release and the, do, and the door handle dropped inside the, draw, the door skin. So when I went to get back out the second time, the door handle disappeared. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, and so then Roland went, right, okay, we'll, we'll better start making them out of metal so they don't, um, you know, they can't melt in a fire and you get trapped inside the car. So a couple of little things, and obviously the position of the fuel cell got changed. So, you know, those little things that came out of it to just, you know, make the sport a little bit safer. So uh, it was um, some positive things came out of it. Next round, the only thing I did do differently at Winton, because I was a little bit nervous off the, off the line, was that, and I'd probably do this in, in any sort of racing now, is that if I have a choice on the run to turn one to drive along the grid boxes or either side I'd choose the, not the grid boxes <laughs> just on that you know on the off chance that your car's stalled I, if I can choose it I'll, I'll choose not to drive through the grid box yeah so that's probably the only thing I do different now I want to quickly talk about the amazing serendipity here that you've now arrived as the modern day Dr Carl in Formula One because we've got our own Dr Carl in supercars but your new job tell us about it and uh, it's kind of, you said the word ironic earlier, but this is definitely ironic. Yeah, it is, it is ironic, absolutely. Off the back of that, I became more of an advocate for safety. I, I started working in Motorsport Australia, then CAMS for a couple of years as the high performance um, manager. And I did a couple of um, safety talks on, on you know, head and neck safety devices. I've, I've sat on uh, panels talking about safety in the sport. I've done delivered training programs for the FIA all while I was competing still as a, as a co-driver. I've been very lucky the sport's taking me all over the place. I went to Nepal, to Romania, to Sri Lanka, South Korea, all these fantastic places delivering key sort of underlying message of, of safety and, and I guess all that ended up with me having this fantastic opportunity to drive the medical car in Formula One. As we said at the start of this conversation, I've just come, literally touched down from Baku, Azerbaijan. An uninteresting weekend for me. Uninter un uninteresting weekend in the med car is a good weekend. So I, I got to know Alan Vandermover, who was the previous medical car driver. He did 12 seasons straight. He became a very good friend. And we spoke about sh splitting the role, sharing it in, in 2020. And um, obviously it all went pear-shaped with the pandemic and the lockdowns in Melbourne, where I live now. and not being able to leave so I thought it was all um, you know dead in the water 
and and obviously uh, Michael Massey was was um, was was part of that as well. I, I have Mike, Michael, and Alan to thank for uh, for this opportunity. And uh, obviously there's a change of guard. I, I correspondence from the now race director Niels Wittich or Wittich about uh, doing doing some rounds this year. So I, I did the Australian Grand Prix, uh, which all went off without a hitch. I did a couple of um, a couple of recoveries in qualifying. It was Latifi and Stroll and could never find Vettel. He was always off riding a scooter instead. <laughs> Personally, I get a real thrill and kick out of, of doing doing that sort of stuff now. I, I do lots of different roles in motorsport. I love the sport so much. Every so often I get a chance to have a, a fang in something. But for me, the, the kick and thrill that I get is, um, is from giving back or helping out. Do you just stay in the car or when you get to a location like that, are you called into action at all? Well, we, we saw the Grosjean accident, which had. Because that's yeah, exactly here what we I was go. Here we to. go. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask you it. Here, here come the goosebumps. <laughs> um, I watched that, and and yeah, I, my hairs hairs on my arms stood up. Um, the the how similar it was to my accident. The burns or the injuries that Ramon sustained were were so similar. And and I spoke to Alan and Ian. Ian is the doctor, Doctor Ian Roberts, and Alan Vandermeer, who I mentioned before. Um, they were first on scene. Uh, in the med car, Ian was there. You know, Ramon pretty much got out of the car under his own power, but uh, but Ian was, you know, at the face of it. My role, first and foremost, is to get the doctors to the scene of an incident as quickly as possible and, and safely as possible. But then there's this uh, this grey area where there's an unwritten expectation that you do manage or help out or assist in any way, shape or form that, that you can, and whether it's giving... Ian, um, the med pack, or if he asks for the jaws of life, we've got a full jaws of life in the in the boot of the uh, the Aston or the uh, the AMG at some rounds. I can I'm not allowed to use it, but I can hand it to him. There's the extinguishers which I'm allowed to use. I carry a pair of um, medical shears on me in my pocket if, in case I need to cut someone's belt. All the F1 drivers now wear a biometric glove that has the vital signs. So when I arrived at the scene of an incident on track. We already know, you know, what what the uh, the heart rate is, whether the driver's moving in the car. There's a motion sensor. We know how big the impact was. We get that live information of uh, from the the accelerometer. And I feel like, well, it's costly to begin with when it's a uh, when it's a prototype or um, at that at that early stage. There's no reason why we couldn't implement that into into supercars or cup car or even club level motorsport. There's some simple things like that that could potentially save someone's life or you know minimize the impacts of an incident so this is all leading to this moment i reckon and i no one ever wants to see a fire like you went through or what ramon went through but if the day comes and there's a fireball on the side of the road much like the one that you went through and you arrive on the scene as the medical car driver are you going to grab that fire extinguisher and go running towards it no one could possibly blame you for not wanting to do that yeah it's hard to know how you'd respond in that situation. You can practice, you can do all the simulation in the world, but when you're in the, you know, on the on the battlefield, it's a different story. And and I think what's what we're encouraged to do is look after our own well-being, our own safety first and foremost. But I think there's a way of achieving that while still rising to the occasion and, and helping out. Raman could have passed, you know, could have died in that accident. It could have been this. It could have been my fate you know, 11 years ago at Barbagello. You know, we're doing the things that no one really wants to do at the end of the day, and, and we're prepared to get in there and give it a red-hot go. Thanks for listening to Repco Supercars Rewind. Repco, driven by passion for 100 years. And thanks to Carl Reinler and Steve Owen for sitting down with me and recounting their memories in such incredible detail. Since our chat, Carl has actually been back to Europe and recently had a front row seat to the massive start line incident at the British Grand Prix at Silverstone, where thankfully, with his team's immediate medical intervention, all drivers were able to return to the following Grand Prix. Remember, you can subscribe to the pod and also go check out Supercar's post-event podcast series, The Cooldown Lap. It's available first thing on a Monday morning after each event, ready for you to download on your way to work. Catch you next time.